Welcome inside the Austin Bruin Show, a quarantine edition as we take a look at the all-decade team, 10 years of Austin Bruins hockey already in the books. Granted, the 10th year did not end the way that we were hoping with the COVID-19. And speaking of which, I hope you're out there listening. You're healthy. You're staying safe. You're keeping up with your social distancing. We're going to get through the weeds here soon enough, and we'll get back to normal. But without any further ado, I have a special guest co-host with me today, Jason Feldman from the Post Bulletin. Because as we take a look at the all-decade team, there's no one that's been around this team other than maybe ownership and you guys, the fans. There's no one that's been around this team more than Jason. And Jason, thanks for joining me here tonight. Thanks for having me, TJ. It's hard to believe this team's already been around for 10 years. Uh, boy, they've accomplished a lot. So many great players have come through Riverside Arena in that time. Uh, but uh, this is a fun project, and it was fun to go back and just look at some of those old names that kind of laid the groundwork for where the franchise is today. You know, it, it is incredible the amount of talent that's come through here and even though I've only been here for the past two seasons I was the one on the forefront there trying to put together all these names and talking with Craig Patrick and Mike Cooper and our head coach Steve Howard and trying to whittle everything down and boy it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be you know and in my impression I thought I'd be able to just open up the record book and go oh yeah this guy he was really good but you know there was so many names and there are so many names that got left off, um, which we'll talk about here because I really want to hear from you being around a lot of these players and having interviewed a lot of these players and written stories around these guys, you know, them way better. I've never met half of these guys. So <laughs> I want to hear your input on most of them, but let's just go ahead real quick and give a background to the all decade team. So we're going to take a look at 12 forwards. We're going to take a look at six defensemen and three goaltenders. And we're going to make up the all-decade team. We're first going to talk about the ones that were already announced. The official Austin Bruins all-decade team, which was out this past week on all of our social media. And then, Jason, I want to hear from you who you think might have been able to sneak in there, who you would have put in on your list, who you would have taken out off the current list, if it's any different. If it's not, no big deal. Um, but I will want to hear from you uh, in that regard. And you know what? Why don't we just go ahead – and jump right into the forwards and we'll begin with someone who I know you're very fond of. You you tweeted about him almost the moment that the list came out, but Brian Backnack, the forward, uh, currently playing in the SPHL. What do you remember about him on the ice? Yeah, I, you know, TJ, I don't want to say it was a surprise to see his name on the list, but when I think back on some of those teams, you know, that had the deep playoff runs, the Robertson Cup teams, he comes to mind just because of his grit, his personality, his tenacity. I mean, I think like I, I tweeted, you know, the guy would have would have skated through a brick wall for coaches or he sure would have tried, you know, and I, I don't think that's terribly in his case. If they'd have told him to do it, he'd probably go tried to do it at least. Um, but he was one of those guys that not only, you know, he could score, but that wasn't always his role. Um, I think he had something like 25 goals, 50-some points through two seasons with the team. But what I remember most about him is he was the guy that I wouldn't call him an enforcer, but he wasn't afraid to mix it up. And, and uh, you know, he, he lived inside the heads of many an opponent for a couple of years while he was wearing black and gold. He was the guy that would uh, get in a scrap with somebody. And as they were skating to the penalty box, he would throw his arms up in the air and get the crowd into it. And he'd be smiling at the guy the whole way to the box. So he was just one of those guys that, uh, he had that personality that, that fans just latched on to, you know, the, the hard-nosed personality that you want to see in a player in this league. And, um, you know, fans came to love him, and uh, he, he loved playing in Austin and, and loved playing for his teammates. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned especially the throwing the hands in the air and pumping the crowd up because when we were doing our list, he was one of the guys originally that was on the bubble that we were kind of like, well, do we include him? But Mike Cooper kept saying, you know, the way the crowd gravitated towards him, the way he just got Riverside Arena juiced up, the way he played in his personality, another word that you used, was pretty much the reason that we put him in there. Because when you take a look at his stats, it's not that he was awful. Through 92 games, he ended up with 37 points so he's averaging about 0.4 points per game so it's not terrible and he was a team captain in that 14-15 season he had the C on his chest so he was definitely 
uh, a player that made an impact while he was here. And one of the other things that we were thinking about when making this list was not only the impact that they had on Riverside Arena while they were here, but also what have they done since they've left, especially to help bring the Austin Bruins name to some other leagues and some other divisions. And of course, he played NCAA D3 at Adrian. And now he went on, as I mentioned, playing some professional hockey uh, in the Southern Pro Hockey League, the SPHL with the Knoxville Ice Bears. And it's funny, uh, I would love to see him play a game for the Ice Bears. I broadcast about seven or eight games at the Knoxville Coliseum. And that ice is smaller than it should be. It's, it's a smaller sheet of ice to the point. And when I say smaller, it's length. So the goal lines are practically up against the back wall. I would love to see him flying around and going around a corner, and just taking somebody out. I think sounds that like would his be, type of place to play. Exactly right. I, I would love to see him play. So our first player, Brian Backneck, and we're just going in alphabetical order here. We didn't go through the hassle of of actually ranking anybody. It's just in alphabetical order. Um, you also said he was a pretty good interview, huh? Backneck. Oh, he was a great interview. He was one of those guys that you knew. Win or lose, you could go to him, and he would give you an honest answer. He would. Uh, he, he was a guy that, um, if I remember right, I think he wore a letter either as a captain or an alternate captain his second year with the team. Um, he he would uh, he would take a lot of the responsibility on his shoulders when the team lost, and he was the first to credit his teammates when they would win a game. Um, and he was a guy who he was that uh, prototypical know your role and embrace it and go out there and do exactly what team needs. And, and uh, you know, like I said, I, I was maybe a tiny bit surprised to see him on this list just because of the, the point total and so many guys who, who have scored, you know, so many points for the Bruins over the years. But to see him on there for all the right reasons is, uh, is a pretty cool honor. Yeah, you, you know, as much as you think that you can just go down the list and put the top 10 goal scorers or top 10 point getters, you know, there are other intangibles that you got to think about. And that's something that we thought about heavily from, you know, just their personality and the way that they acted in the locker room and they, you know, behaved with fans and in your case, behaved with media. So Brian Backnack is the first player. Uh, moving on and with our forwards, Jay Dickman. This is another big one. Of course, he had a very successful career at Michigan State as a forward. He's now also playing professional hockey. What do you remember about Dickman back in his years when he played with the Bruins? First thing that stands out about Jay was his size. And I know you, you've watched, or well, I guess Austin Ruschoff's been gone for a few years. You didn't get to see Austin, did you? But it's sort of, uh, you know, to see a guy that tall on skates, I think Jay was, what, 6'5 or 6'6". Six, six, Austin, who we'll talk about in a little bit, is listed at six seven. But um, you know, I remember watching Jay play in high school um, when he was playing at. Uh, it was Bemidji. I'm sorry. Um, not, well, yeah, Bemidji State. It was Bemidji that. State, not uh, not Michigan State. Wanted to correct that. Sorry. But, about that. Uh, no, yeah, St. Paul native. I remember watching him come down here and play when he was in high school. And, and you see the six five guy on skates, the big body, the big frame. You think, well, he's just out there to bang guys around. But I remember his shot and his skating ability and just. Just his hands for a guy, um, you know, he just, he stood out, you know, he just, he, he couldn't stop watching him and not only because of his size, you watched him for his size, but then the skill was there too. And you notice that as you watched him go along and he brought that same thing to Austin. I mean, he was again, one of those guys that, you know, could play any kind of game you wanted him to play. He could skate well for a big guy. Um, you know, he could, he could score skillfully. He had a heavy shot, all the things you would think of from a typical, you know, big power forward like that it goes on to play division one hockey yeah and then eventually ends up going pro as well as i'm taking a look at his high school stats i mean it's incredible to see 111 points in 70 games played with saint paul johnson high he actually started his junior career played 12 games with fargo and in those 12 games he had five points as well so i mean he was clearly an offensive power currently uh he finished the 2019-20 season with the wichita thunder in the echl he's now bounced around three different echl teams he began last year with the florida everblades played three games he started this year with the Indy Fuel and then moved on to the Wichita Thunder. And he's still getting production despite the fact that you might, you know, look at that and go, wow, you know, why can't the guy stick at one team? He's played so far in 17 games in his uh, professional career, and he's got a total of seven – or excuse me, eight points. Eight points in 17 games, you're almost half a point per game player in the ECHL, the, the double A of the professional level. That's some pretty good offensive output. 
He's been a productive player wherever he's gone. And, and what I remember, too, about his scoring when he was here in Austin, he played on, on lines with guys who could really light, light up the scoreboard. And he played with, with natural goal scorers. But what you saw was eventually teams having to respect his ability to score, too. And that really opened things up for his teammates around him. And you, know, you think back to the guys in that era, the, the 2013, 2014, 2015 guys I mean not that these guys who play now for the Bruins over the past years aren't team first guys but you know that was really what made those teams and those players so successful is I think they bought into the fact that you know if you go play your role help your team win and have the success the scouts are going to come you're not going to get lost in the shuffle you know if you go out and do what you're asked to do and Jay was one of those guys and it paid off for him with a nice college career and now a professional career. Absolutely. So Jay Dickman is our second forward uh, in the 2019-2020, the all-decade team, as we're calling it. So let's go ahead. We'll move on to our third forward, Gilbert Gabor. Of course, we saw Kevin here earlier this year. The Bruins ended up shipping him down to Odessa as part of a deadline day deal. But Gilbert Gabor, I heard, I think he might have been the first alumni name who came across my ears when I first joined the Bruins. He was such a, a crowd favorite. That's what, that's the impression that I seem to get from him. He was, and I, I didn't get to watch Gilbert play as much as some of these other guys that we've talked about already. But um, yeah, from everything I remember about him, um, he was a guy who was only in Austin for a year, but it took him almost no time. To, uh, to have the crowd warm up to him, to have teammates warm up to him. Um, just his style of play, um, again, one of those guys who, uh, you know, could score, um, would set up his teammates, was a really good, just, you know, dynamic two-way forward, um, fun to watch, and a big guy, another big body guy. I think he was about, what, 6'3", 215-ish, 220-ish, something like that. Exactly I don't right. know if he was quite that heavy when he played here, but um, – yeah, just a, again, another guy, you, you could see the, the talent in him um, from the time he stepped on the ice and the unselfishness. You know, he could score, but he was also more than willing and, and capable of setting up his teammates. He wasn't afraid to scrap a little bit, too. I think he had 120-some penalty minutes or somewhere in that range, too. Yeah, and you know when you take a look at just his overall career, he played juniors in Sweden, then decided to come over to Canada. He was actually playing in the OHL in the Ontario Hockey League. He played two years with the Owen Sound Attack, which is the OHL. I mean, you're talking Tier 1 Canada. That's where kids are drafted right out of there into the NHL and immediately on NHL rosters. They almost never have to even work their way up. And he had a pre- he had some good production. He ended up putting up 20 points in 110 games. So it was clear that he might have been just not up to snuff for the OHL level. And he really found his home when he came to Austin. It was uh, a, two years later because he decided after he was done with the, U, uh, the OHL, he went back to Sweden and then came back to North America where he joined the Austin Bruins, 58 points in 55 games. No wonder he was a crowd favorite, a point per game player. Boy, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, you look at his time in the OHL and he was, he was on the ice a lot. As you said, he played in over a hundred games. Um, so I think he was probably asked to play a different role there. I'm, I'm sure he was, you know, he was younger at the time too, obviously a couple years younger. Um, than when he played in Austin. But, boy, when he came here and they put him in that role, um, you know, seeing a lot of ice time, not only, you know, on the top lines, but uh, on power play units as well, um, to show off what he could do. Again, that that combination of size and skill, um, he really kind of blossomed into his own. And I believe he's, he's still playing pro hockey, isn't he, back home in Slovakia? In Slovakia, that's right. He's playing for HC Banksa Bistirica. I'm not too familiar with the <laughs> Slovakian Pro League. I can tell you that it is the top league in Slovakia. It is the the NHL of the Slovakian country. But uh, other than, and he's still putting up some okay numbers. You know, he's got 15 points this past year, and I'm assuming their season was cut a little bit short. Uh, 10 points a year before, 18 points, and this is all in around 45, 50 ish games a year. So he's still putting up some good numbers even at the pro level. Yeah, and I noticed his penalty minutes have gone up over there too, so maybe he's playing more of that um, shutdown line type role, third, fourth line type guy where he's not asked to score a lot, which I'm assuming was probably uh, the case for him too when he was playing the OHL. Oh, for sure, for sure. And, you know, you're, you're, he was not afraid, like you said, to mix it up when he was here in Austin. With those, It was 119, so you hit the nail right on the head with that. 
Uh, I'm, I'm just looking for penalty minutes. Uh, the most in a season was actually Zach Kennedy in 15-16 with 159. So Gilbert wasn't too far off. He might have even held that record uh, had he not been teammates with Zach Kennedy that season. Right, right. Yeah, and clearly uh, he's back in that role now at home playing professional hockey. And, uh, you know, good to see that he's still playing. I think that's that's one of the things that has, um, again, maybe not surprised me, but it's kind of neat to see the number of guys who came through Austin in the early to middle part of the decade that are still playing hockey even beyond college, whether it's in the U.S. or, or in mm-hmm. Europe or elsewhere. As a matter of fact, that brings me to a really good point. If you're curious ever at any time to, if you're wondering about what players have done after they've left the Bruins, you can always go to www.austinbruins.com slash alumni. I update that every single time I hear a former alumni is signing to a new team, or if we have a player that commits somewhere or switches schools, if he transfers or something along those lines. So it is absolutely up to date right now. It's the entire list of every Austin Bruin, where they've gone, where else they've played, what they've done, if they've been drafted into the NHL, you name it. Um, and that list is lengthy. It's it's very lengthy, as a matter of fact. I used to be able to do it on one eight and a half by eleven PDF, but now I got to stretch it out to an eleven by fourteen before I upload it because it's just it's very very long. And there's there's some names on there that I'm sure the the more casual Bruins fans are going to go, "Who's this guy?" You know, because he only played twenty five thirty games with us. But hey, that's an alumni. Once a Bruin, always a Bruin. That's the rule. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know you. you mentioned that there's probably a really long list of players who have maybe only played half a season or a season here in Austin, but some of that is due to splitting time with USHL teams and then moving on to college. But like you said, once a Bruin, always a Bruin. And there's been um, dozens and dozens of, of really talented players who have come through here and, and moved on to the higher levels of hockey. Speaking of really talented players, as we move on, let's take a look at our fourth forward. One of the more recent guys Travis Kothenbutel, formerly the all-time leading scorer up until this past January, he must have been electric. This He left the Bruins and headed to University of Nebraska, Omaha, right before I got here. So I never had the chance to meet Travis, but I've heard so much about him and how electrifying he was on the ice. He, he was. I think you hit the nail on the head with that word, electrifying. And, and he was one of those guys that – um, he earned everything that he got to. I mean, the kid could obviously score. Um, he could he could play. He was a t- really good two way forward, playing at both ends of the ice. Um, but you know, he came out of high school and he actually played uh, almost a full season in the NA three. I think it was the 2014-15 season when the Bruins hosted the Robertson Cup. Um, I think Travis played maybe eight to ten games with the team that year, if I remember right. That's right. Um, before before coming to Austin full time the next season, but. Um, you know, the thing that, that I remember most about watching him is, uh, you know, I think the word that defines him is competitor. He hated to lose. He was one of these guys that you could see it um, when the team lost a game, he would be standing outside the locker room and you could, you could see it on his face. Like that, you know, it was, there, there was nothing probably more in the world that he, that he hated than losing a hockey game. And uh, that has served him well. And there, there were nights um, at Riverside and on the road when he put the team on his back and, and refused to let them lose. I know that's a cliche, but it was true with him. Um, I don't know that I've seen a player more come through the Bruins that, that hated to lose than Travis did. It's funny that you mentioned his NA3 days because the NA3HL, I'm not sure if you had the chance to see this, they recently put out, they've been putting out their NA3HL success stories. And that was the first one that they did. He played with Granite City and then came to Austin and then, of course, set all kinds of Bruins offensive records here and then went on to a Division One school. So he's kind of... I don't want to say the poster child of the NA3, but he's one of those perfect examples when they're talking about recruitment at the NA3 level where the Rochester Grizzlies play, North Iowa Bulls, all that good stuff. He's kind of like the perfect example when you're talking to a kid and and they say, well, how's this going to help me get a deal? Well, this is, here's a perfect example of someone who started in the NA3, just made huge waves in the NA and earned himself a D1 commitment. And now he's playing at Omaha. Right, and I think you know, through two years now of watching the Rochester Grizzlies play, um, that's sort of the message, not sort of, it is the message that the coaches give to every kid there. You know, this this league, the NA3, the NA, it's what you make of it. Um, you know, you have that opportunity 
to go out there and improve what you're capable of doing. And Travis did that at every step. He made it almost impossible for the coaches not to put him in a lineup right away as a young player. Um, he made it almost impossible for the Bruins coaching staff not to bring him in. I mean, he was going to play somewhere at the NA level. And uh, again, I think the Bruins and, and Travis are happy that it ended up being in Austin. So far through his collegiate career, he's got nine points in a total of 43 games. So he's still trying to find his way and find his footing. And I'm sure he's playing bottom line minutes, particularly last year as a freshman. Um, this year, he's probably still playing second half line minutes, you know, not getting in there every single shift that he possibly can. So we're going to turn our attention from him to someone who's had some great success at the collegiate level, the two-time defending national champion, Jade Miller. Doesn't have the chance to defend his title and go for possibly a third this year because, of course, the coronavirus and COVID-19 and all that with the league shutting down. But let's talk a little bit about Jade Miller. Yeah, I like that we have these two guys back-to-back -back because in a lot of ways they're very similar players. Jade was one of those guys that came in in the 2014-15 season um, when the Bruins were absolutely loaded with talent um, in front of him at forward. And he was a lot like Travis Cuthambuto, where he went out on the ice day after day, uh, didn't say a whole lot, kept his mouth shut, but um, just worked for what he got. And, uh, you know, he was in the lineup a lot throughout both of his seasons, especially his second season with the Bruins. Um, but another guy that, you know, became a, a real team leader and um, earned a college, a spot on a college team. Um, obviously a very darn good college team too. Um, but yeah, Jade was another one of those guys that just, um, you know, work ethic is what's gotten him to where he is. So if I asked you to describe him in one work in one word, would it be work ethic? Work ethic, is it tenacious, anything like that? Any of those sort of words that are, are synonyms there? Um, you know, the thing, the story that I always love to tell about Jade is, so he grew up in North Dakota, not far from where I grew up, a um, little town called uh, Minto, but he played for a high school called Grafton. Um, he made it to a state championship game with them, lost, came to Austin, lost in the Robertson Cup, <laughs> went to UMD. <laughs> He gets to the championship game, finally wins it. And, and I remember in 2018 when the, the first time that he became a national champion, champion with Duluth, um, going to the locker room, it happened to be at the XL Center in St. Paul. And he was holding on to the championship trophy. And myself and another reporter were standing there waiting to talk to him. And uh, he said, you guys go ahead and start asking questions because I'm not going to let go of this. Thing. <laughs> he, he had been through enough. Yeah, uh, in his in his formative years of hockey, that once he got his hands on one of those trophies, he wasn't about to let it go. What's that old cliche? Always a bridesmaid, never a bride, right? It felt like it for Jade for for many years, but boy, what a um, you know, just couldn't be happier for a guy who has worked hard to get to that level. Um, and he didn't forget either, you know, the the role that his two years in Austin played in his success. I, I think after they won. UMD won the national championship in 2018. I believe it was one of the first home games for us in the following year when he came down and, and dropped the uh, dropped a ceremonial puck to start a game. So um, he always had lots of good things to say about his time in a Bruins uniform. And, uh, you know, just really glad to see him have the success that he had at UMD. He's one of those guys now that he's wrapped up his collegiate career that I'm keeping my eye on closely because I have a feeling he's going to sign a professional deal somewhere with someone, you know, and I think a lot of with all this that's going on in society right now and it, things are just kind of delayed, but he's one of those guys that I'm kind of keeping my eye and I'm just waiting for the moment that I got to write a press release about him signing with, you know, some professional team, whether it's the ECHL, AHL, NHL level. Uh, he's definitely one of those guys. Yeah, I agree. He's um, another one of those guys that, you know, like we've talked about before, uh, you ask him to play a role and he's going to go do it. And that's what's made him the success that he is. Um, you know, he's, he's not a guy that has to go out or feels like he has to go out and score 30 goals a season. You know, if you give him a third or a fourth line role, he's going to go out and play that to the best of his ability. And um, you know, he's going to help a team somewhere. If he wants to keep playing, I have to feel like there are opportunities out there for him. Like you said, when we get through um, you know, things that we're going through right now. So we'll go from one JM to another JM. Justin Miziak currently playing at Michigan Tech. He's going to get a brand new teammate next year 
in Jed Pietala, but we can talk about him in a little bit. What do you remember from Justin Miziak? Because as I take a look, he was only here for one year, one season, 60 games, 60 total points. Was this just – and well-balanced, it looks like. Right, yeah. He was, again, another one of those guys that, uh, you know, if he wanted to take over a game and be a team's leading goal scorer, he would do that. Uh, but he also understood that, you know, he had the ability to set up his teammates and make – his line mates look good, and you know he he was uh, a, a guy who knew that if he was able to do that, that that would lead to team success. Um, but when the team needed him, you know he was there to step up. I think that the one stat that really sticks out to me with him um, is, uh, like you said, the balance. I think he had something like what twenty—I I can't remember—twenty-five goals, thirty-five assists, somewhere That's in exactly that range. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And he was here two years. I missed the first line. He right. was here 15, 16, and 16, 17. And it was that second year where he was 25 goals, 35 assists, was spot on. Um, I mean, the guy scored 95 goals in 118 games. That is just some the, – the, that's the reason – one of the reasons he made our list is simply because – that balance, that kind of offensive production during two seasons, which weren't the greatest in Bruins history. They weren't the worst either. Um, he was definitely a playmaker. Right. Yeah. And uh, his speed is another thing that, that sticks out to me. Wasn't the biggest guy in the world, but um, fast, really good hands. Um, he had what, 40 some points as a, as a rookie, his first year with the Bruins. So um, you kind of knew at that point that this is a kid that's going to be able to go on and, and play and play really well at a higher level. And he's doing that right now. Again, doesn't have a, a ton of points at Michigan Tech through three seasons, but, um, you know, again, just a kid that's gone there and, and played his role and uh, I think is really appreciative to be playing Division One hockey for a storied program. So we'll, uh, we'll move on from, from Ju- uh, Justin Miziak here, and we're going to head – to a guy that you already mentioned, because I want to kind of get through these. I know we don't want to keep you here for eight hours talking about these guys, because I'm sure we can. Um, let's go ahead and talk about Austin Reichoff. And it's so funny, as I was digging up some of the stats on the guys over this past week, and I'm on EliteProspects.com, one of their featured articles, undrafted free agent profile, New York Rangers lock up, rangy, I like what they did there, Austin Reichoff. What do you remember about him as an Austin Bruin? Um, well, I mean, obviously the thing that sticks out about him at first is his size. And, you know, I mentioned him a little bit when we were talking about Jay Dickman. It's, it's the same thing and, and to an even greater degree. Um, you know, you see this six seven guy on skates and you're thinking, wow, he, he must go into the corner and, and bang bodies and put people through the glass. And he's certainly capable of doing that. But, um, you know, he's another guy that the more you watch him, just his skill jumps out. He makes you notice him um, as more than just a big guy on skates. Um, another guy that, you know, I wasn't really sure what his role would be or, or how his division one career would go. I knew he could be an effective player at Western Michigan, but to see him go there and, um, you know, put up the, the totals that he's put up there in three seasons, um, you know, obviously the NHL scouts noticed him too. Um, so yeah, just, uh, another one of those guys that, um, you know, knows what his strengths are. And his strengths are a little bit of everything. You know, another good two-way forward, um, a guy who can score and a guy who's capable of setting up his teammates as well. I never obviously got a chance to see him play as a Bruin, but he's one of those guys who I've been able to watch some video of, especially over the last month, month and a half, you know, after he made the signing, you know, there's plenty of blogs out there for the New York Rangers saying, this is who we just signed and what he does. The one thing it seems that every little Twitter video and everything that's being put together because of his size, like you said, he just had the ability to just force his way into the slot and move people. You know, he was like Moses. Like he'd just walk into the slot and move people out of his way and get into those high traffic, high scoring areas and just force his way into plays. And that's something I think that he's going to need at the NHL level for sure. Exactly. I was just thinking that too. That's exactly what will make him an effective pro. And I'm sure that's what, what the Rangers loved about him and, you know, what they're going to want him to do too. Um, you know, it's funny. We talk about all these guys from the Bruins who have moved on to play high level college hockey and then pro hockey. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm from North Dakota. We were up watching University of North Dakota game a couple of years ago. 
Uh, they were playing Alaska Anchorage, and I poked my fiance in the in the arm when Anchorage goalie was announced. They said, "Hey, that's a former Bruin. It was Chris Carlson." And we happened to be up there in late February this year again. And uh, as we were introduced in the starting lineup the second night, the first two guys I poked her in the arm and said, "Hey, those are former Austin Bruins. One was Austin, uh, one was Dawson DiPietro." So it, it's really fun to watch these guys you know, not only on TV, but to see them in person and just see the things that they've gone on to do uh, after playing here. And it's almost sort of remarkable at times to think that Jesus used to sit in Riverside Arena and watch these guys on a nightly basis. It's, a, it's, it's pretty cool to see, uh, you know, just how many guys have gone on to, to bigger things. Yeah, absolutely. And and DiPietro, he was a guy that we tossed around when we were talking about the, you know, the all decade team. But unfortunately, you know, when you take a look at his stats, he only played 30 games with the Bruins. He had some great production, 28 points in those 30 games, but he also played 29 games with Janesville, Cooley region, you know, in 14, 15, he played 41 games. So we felt that, you know, there were other guys who spent a little bit more time with the Bruins um, who, who were more ingrained in the fabric of the team. So that's why Dawson DiPietro didn't make the list. Uh, another Western Michigan Bronco and teammate of Austin, of course, as you just mentioned. So if in case anybody's out there listening, why didn't Dawson DiPietro make the list? Well, that's kind of some of the thinking. Uh, that went into why he didn't make the list. So after Austin Reischoff, we'll take a look at the most recent Austin Bruin and the all-time leading scorer, the all-time leading assist getter, the all-time leader in power play points, Dante Sheriff. What are your thoughts on Dante? I know how Dante I've seen for the last two seasons. He's one of the few guys on this list that I can actually speak about from my own experiences. What are your experiences in watching? Right. You've seen Dante more than I have, but you know, I remember from the time Dante came into Austin um, talking to the coaching staff and then, and them saying about him, you know, this is a kid that if he goes out and works as hard as we want him to work and we think he can, he could be the best player in the league. And, you know, he was either there or right on the cusp of that this season with, uh, you know, not only his ability to score, but, you know, the assist numbers that this guy put up in his, what, three seasons with the Bruins are astounding at this level. Um, And I can't wait to see what he does at Mercyhurst and how he fits into the program out there. You know, sometimes with guys, when they go to college, their freshman year is kind of just a take notes year. You know, you're scratched more often than you're playing and you're just sitting back learning the systems. I think it's safe to say that with Dante, he's going to be immediately into the fold out for the Mercyhurst Lakers, wouldn't you say? Uh, Absolutely, I think so. And the the things that stuck out to me at first with him were just watching him skate. um, So fluid. Yeah, very just smooth. Uh, makes me jealous. You know, wish I had a tenth of that ability. And um, but then you, you know you see the the way that he works with his line mates, um, the way that he just knows where they're going to be and sets them up. And I think he was well, he's tied for the league lead this year in assists, right? In, in the whole NHL, he was, and he was tied for fourth in points. And honestly, if we would have played out the rest of the season, he very well could have taken over that top spot. Right, right. And that's the thing that will always stick out to me about Dante is just you know, talking to, to Coach Howard at the start of this season um, and him saying that, you know, I really believe this kid could be the best player in the league if he puts his mind to it. And uh, he went out and, and pretty much achieved that. It's so electric. electric and one of my greatest on ice memories so far with the Austin Bruins in my two years, immediately the first thing I think of is last year's paint the ring pink game, him blocking that shot at the blue line, going the other way on the uh, breakaway overtime winner on paint the ring pink. I mean, that was just absolutely an exciting moment and you knew it was going to happen from the moment he took possession of that puck. You knew it. You just knew it. It was going to go in and sure enough, he put it in. So, Let's go ahead real quick. We'll recap our forwards that we have as we're more than halfway through. Brian Backnack, Jay Dickman, Gilbert Gabor, Travis Cothenbutel, Jade Miller, Justin Miziak, Austin Reischoff, and Dante Sheriff. I'm TJ Shalott, voice of the Austin Bruins. Joining me, Jason Feldman from the Post Bulletin as we continue to break down the all-decade team for the Austin Bruins. And let's just jump right into the next one, John Simonson. This is a guy that I didn't hear too much about. You don't hear a lot of people talking about him. But when you look at the stats and you look at the Bruins' history, he's all over the place. 
That's kind of the way Simo has been everywhere he's gone. You don't hear a lot of people talking about him, but all he does is produce. Um, you know, I think if, if you ask me to boil his game down to just a couple of words, it would be heart and soul. He's one of those heart and soul guys. The a, a team leader, whether he has a letter on his jersey or not, um, and he's just one of those guys that quietly racks up points. Um, he, he could do, again, he could do whatever you ask him to do. He could, he's, can take a face off in a key situation. He can play power play or play penalty kill. Um, just, you know, if you had a dozen of him on your team, you, you would be a championship contender year in and year out. Just one of my favorite all time Bruins um, went on and he, he proved it in Lincoln too in the USHL before he went on to a good college career at North Dakota. Uh, he had almost 60 points for Lincoln in the one year he played there. So it's I'm very happy to see him on this list too. It's incredible to see his production just jump up in those three junior years, 38 points in his rookie year, 57 in his second year. Then he goes up to the USHL and most guys who are putting up 57 points in the NA, they're going to take a step back when they go to the USHL. They're either not going to be playing the same minutes or just because the game's a little bit faster um, they're not going to have as much production. So they'll take a little step back. Not Simonson. He puts up those 59 points that you just mentioned. He continues um, to just go up and up and up. And like you said, it earned him that Division I uh, commitment to North Dakota where he was an assistant captain the last two, uh, the final two years of his career. But that's where it ended for, for John Simonson. He had decided not to go pro. Not sure if the offers weren't there or, or what it might be, but he's certainly an all-decade player for the Bruins. Yeah, and like Jaden Miller, in a national championship won uh, with North Dakota in 2016. So, um, you know, he wasn't here for either of the Robertson Cup teams, but uh, went back to his hometown and won a national championship. And I can't imagine, you know, if that was the end of his hockey career, I can't imagine it ending in a much better way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's keep moving right down the list. We'll take a look at the um, – one of the first huge impact players for the Austin Bruins in their existence, CJ Smith, bouncing back and forth between the AHL and the NHL in the Buffalo Saber system over the last three or four years. What do you remember from CJ as a junior player? Did you get a chance to see him a lot when I you're did. at that point? Yeah, I did. I watched CJ quite a bit. And you want to talk about a, a dynamic player? I mean, you could see it. Um, from the time that he stepped on the ice, that this kid was going to be a force offensively. Um, I think he only he had, what, about 13 goals, 25-ish points in his first season here. But, boy, the leap he took in his second year, I don't know that it surprised anybody because you know, we saw flashes of it in the 2011-12 season. Um, but he was still a young guy when he came and played here, um, fresh out of high school. But, man, you could just, like I said, you, you could – you can see it. He's just one of those guys that, you know, I don't know how to exactly describe what he did well because he did a little bit of everything well. It's just, you know, you know a score when you see one, and, and CJ was that guy. One thing that I always kind of – I like to look at in terms of where guys are going to college is where they're from. And here's CJ, a Midwest guy from Des Moines, playing here in Austin, played in Muskegon, also played for the Chicago Steel. All those – in this upper Midwest area. And then here he is going to UMass Lowell and shipped out to the East coast where he stayed ever since with Buffalo and the Rochester Americans. But he was the first, like I mentioned, he was kind of the, that first impact player. There was Brandon Wallen who earned an honorable mention, which we'll get to here in a, in a little bit, but he seemed to be that first guy. Now, again, I wasn't around for this, but I, I have a feeling that the buzz around him was, this kid could make it to the NHL even back then. Exactly. And I think if I remember right, he came here as a, as a 17 year old. And, um, you know, again, it was just one of those things where he had to, he, the skill set was there, but he had to let the body and the game mature and develop. Um, he learned a lot. You could tell in just that first season here in Austin. Um, and it really carried over to, to the second season when he was a, a point per game guy. And that was at a time when the Bruins had a little bit of a pipeline out to, you know, Lowell, the UMass area. Um, obviously, Christian Fullen went out there, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Guillaume McClare, another uh, small but skilled forward, ended up going to Lowell. And uh, CJ was another one that came through the Bruins program and, and went on to Lowell and had a lot of success at the college level, too. Yep. 
and and CJ is doing the same thing in the American Hockey League, which of course is the second highest level of hockey here in North America. Forty four points in his rookie year in 2017-18 with the Rochester Americans. Then he got his first call up the following year. He started the season with the Buffalo Sabers in 18-19. Uh, which was last year, two goals in 11 games with the Buffalo Sabres, but has been relegated back to the American Hockey League ever since. 58 points with Rochester to finish up 18-19, 27 points this season before the American Hockey League went on pause. They haven't announced whether or not the season's going to be finished or if they're going to continue at a later date, much like the NHL. But he's got 27 points in 50 games this year for the Americans. So C.J. Smith, one of the first true success stories with, like, as you mentioned, Christian Fallen, who we'll talk about in a minute. And this one, a more recent success story in an NHL system, Nico Sturm. I've heard a lot about Nico Sturm. I've had the pleasure of meeting Nico Sturm and interviewing him last season when he was up in St. Paul as part of the development camp for the Minnesota Wild. He's currently playing for the Iowa Wild. Talk about a guy who could flat out play. Well, he was, yeah, I mean, you could see it. Uh, another one of those guys from, from the time he stepped on the ice here, he just, he had that pro hockey frame, if that makes sense. I mean, he just looked like a hockey player and then he stepped on the ice and he had the skill and, uh, you know, the knowledge, the, the hockey IQ to back it up. Um, I think he was, if I remember correctly, the first Bruin to ever play in a world junior championship and he played for Germany. Um, went on to Tri-City and then obviously three fantastic years at Clarkson and just, you know, really happy to see the guy sign with the wild organization. Um, but yeah, he, he was another one of those guys that when he came in here, he was playing on a really good team with a bunch of guys who had been here the year before all knew each other, but he fit right into that lineup, found his niche. And, uh, you know, he, the thing about Nico was he didn't score a ton of goals, but you could see the offensive ability there. Another one of those guys that, that, uh, played with so much talent around him and made those guys better. The hockey IQ. And I think that's something that I got the impression of just talking to him a little bit and doing an interview is just that his mind, you could see his mind constantly running. You could see just, you could see him out there on the ice doing the calculations and you're right. He didn't score a lot of goals when he was with the Bruins. He ended up with 41 points, but 11 goals and 30 assists. So that tells me he's a guy that's constantly looking for the open man, constantly looking for the chance. And he had the ability to get the puck over to the other side, to drop it back wherever he needed to get it. He would put it in the hands of a score, uh, one of the bigger scorers and someone who could put it in the back in the net and if you look at his first year playing in North America it was actually 13-14 when he played with Corpus Christi um, in the NAHL he played in 21 games he had three points and that following season he breaks open with Austin 53 games and those 41 points so I think as you know as skilled as he is and as intelligent as he was it was a perfect mixture with his teammates that he was paired with everybody lifted each other up and we've talked about how many guys so far from that 2014-15 roster right and i think with nico uh just being in austin and being in minnesota and you heard him say this a little bit after he signed with the wild though but he just felt so comfortable in this area um he loved minnesota he loved austin he loves being in, in the twin cities now um having that as his second year over in North America, maybe that helped too. Maybe he felt more comfortable being up here and um, was able to relax and, and you know, show everybody who he truly is as a player. Exactly right. Went on to Captain Clarkson to a uh, Frozen Four last season and then signed his deal with the Minnesota Wild. He's already got eight games played in the NHL. Uh, two points. He got two assists earlier this year in uh, six games. And he's having a great season with the Iowa Wild in the American Hockey League. 32 points in 55 games. So let's roll right on. Another guy that has a contract with an NHL team, Josh Wilkins. Left the Bruins, went to Providence, had a great career at Providence, signs himself a deal with the Nashville Predators. Josh Wilkins, not a big guy, if I'm not mistaken, but I, if I, I, from some of the things I've heard, he had some great hands. Oh, yeah, and that was what set him apart. Uh, um and I remember talking to the coaching staff during Josh's season here. Again, it was a, that 14-15 season. And I don't think he was fully comfortable until about the halfway point of the year. Um, 
you know, he had traveled all over the country to play hockey, grew up in North Carolina, uh, played for the LA Junior Kings for a while, and came to Austin again as another young player. Um, I, think he, I think he was another one of those guys that was only about 17 years old when he showed up in Austin, um, you know, playing against 19, 20 year olds in a lot of cases. But, but once he got comfortable, um, around his teammates with his line mates and found his groove and got that confidence in himself that he could play at the NA level and that he could go beyond that, that, that possibility was, was right there in front of him. Um, you know, he really opened up and you could see it in that second half of his season in Austin that he just, the hands, the dynamic playmaking ability, he showed all of that. And, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that he had the career he did at Providence and now, uh, you know, in the Nashville organization. You know, and here's another guy that is balanced. You know, starting with his career with the Austin Bruins, 27 points that season, 11 goals, 16 assists. He would go on to the USHL, 16 goals, 13 assists. So, I mean, you're, you're plus minus right now five, you know, goals versus assists. That carried on through college at Providence as well. 13 goals in his rookie year, 18 assists. 15 goals, 16 assists in his second year and his most lucrative year, 20 goals, 26 assists in his junior year. Then he signs the deal with the Predators. He's currently playing with the Milwaukee Admirals, their American Hockey League team. That's the third player that we've mentioned on this list that's playing in the American Hockey League. And we'll wait, we'll hold out on Austin Reichoff. That could be the fourth player if he doesn't make an NHL roster this upcoming year. Um, But so far, so good for Josh Wilkins in Milwaukee. 15 points, three goals, and 12 assists. That'll bring us to the end of the forwards. Let's go ahead. We'll recap the forwards one more time, Jason. Brian Backnack, Jay Dickman, Gilbert Gabor, Travis Kothenbutel, Jade Miller, Justin Miziak, Austin Reischoff, Dante Sheriff, John Simonson, CJ Smith, Nico Sturm, and Josh Wilkins. So we'll talk about the honorable mentions, um, and I'll give you a little bit of a reasoning why – behind why some of these guys didn't make it. We thought about putting Ben Olmquist on. He did technically play a full season's worth. He played half of last season and then half of this season, and he was well over a point-per-game player um, and, of course, committing to UMD to play for the Bulldogs, but we just felt that some of the other guys on the list deserved the actual spot before Ben, so we gave him an honorable mention. Evan Cholock, the all-time leader in games played for the Austin Bruins. He also is an honorable mention, as is Austin local John Kirby. Uh, Guillerme LeClaire, Hugh Larkin, and Brandon Wallen, all other honorable mentions. So, let's jump right into the defensemen. We got nine more players, six defensemen, three goaltenders, and we'll begin with another guy with pro experience, Corey Dunn. Another one of my favorite all-time Bruins. Um, this is a guy, my favorite story about Corey is that he, you know, he came in uh, to camp in the 2013-14 season, um, just about didn't make it out of fall camp. He, w- he was going to be one of the last cuts. I don't know which coach or what the decision was that, that, that he ended up getting one of the last spots on the team, but he had come into camp, uh, not a very big guy, but came in, worked his tail off. Um, Earned one of the last spots on the team. I think there was a stretch of, I want to say double digits, probably 10 to 12 games where he didn't play, didn't get in the lineup uh, early in his first season here. Kept coming to practice, kept coming in early, doing all the right things, slowly worked his way into the lineup over the second half of the season. He didn't let that spot go. Uh, Carried it into the next year when he became an alternate captain. Uh, Finished his his Bruins career with uh, 54 points. Ended up playing in um, over 120 games, just uh, and then went on to play you know, four fantastic years of Division Three hockey, and now is playing in the pro ranks. This from a guy who was almost cut coming out of camp, and who knows if he had another shot at hockey or where his career would have gone if one decision would have been different. You know, and I'm really happy for him because last year, his final year in college, he signed his first pro deal, played with the Newfoundland Growlers, ultimately was cut. And the Growlers would go on to win the American Hockey League championship, and he didn't get the chance to hoist uh, the trophy. He didn't get a chance to enjoy that championship run. Um, So I'm sure he's feeling a little down, but here he is in 2019-20 with the Kalamazoo Wings and another former Austin Bruin. Their broadcaster, John Peterson, had the opportunity to call Corey Dunn's games. And Dunn having himself a good year, 11 points and 38 assists. If, for a defenseman, that's all you can ask for. I mean, if you're averaging over a, 
a half or excuse me, a third a point per game as a defenseman, you're doing a good job, especially if you can keep the penalty minutes down and your plus minus a little bit higher. Now he is a minus seven as of right now, but they still got season to go, assuming everything gets uh, back on board. Yeah, and I think Corey is another one of those guys that if you ask him, he would probably attribute where he is now to his time in Austin. Um, he developed, you know, not only did he get that last roster spot and slowly build his way into the lineup, but he developed a confidence that you could see grow over two years and then over the next four years at Adrian College. Um, and the confidence just kept growing. And he, you know, once he believed that he belonged here on this team, and could play at this level, you could just see it in him. Again, not a, not a big guy, but a guy that went from being a healthy scratch for you know almost every game in the first half of his first season with the Bruins, uh, you know, to a guy that they wanted on the ice in every crucial situation in his second season. And he's another D3 guy that ultimately ended up uh, making it to the pros, proven that it doesn't matter what college you go to, if you make an impact, you're going to get noticed. And uh, one guy that certainly got noticed as we move down the list, Christian Follin, played in well over 200 games in the North American Hockey League. He's the alumni of the Austin Bruins. You know, he seems to be the – he's the poster child. It's hard to ignore a guy that's played 240-some-odd games in the National Hockey League with a various different teams, Philadelphia, Montreal. I believe he's with Montreal right now. Um, was he – did he have that kind of buzz that maybe C.J. Smith um, or Nico Sturm or some of those guys have that kind of said, oh, yeah, this kid's going to be playing top-level pro one day? I, I don't know that he did right away um, just strictly because of how he ended up here. Um, you know, here's a kid who had a scholarship offer from a Division One school removed from him at the last minute. He goes and catches on with the Fargo Force in the USHL. They decide that they're going to let him go. Um, They leave him at a truck stop in North Dakota. The Bruins bus picks him up on the way through um, to, to, I believe it was Bismarck. And, you know, he quickly worked his way into the lineup here. He obviously, he had that big frame and the talent. And again, I think it was a case of of getting the guy in the right situation. Um, (laughs) The story that I remember most about him is is early on in his career with the Bruins. uh, He was doing a, drill with then head coach Chris Talk, where uh, there was a puck along the boards and Talk kept kind of, you know, two-handing him in the back um, as Christian was trying to dig the puck out and Christian got ticked and he threw an elbow back and hit Talk right in the face, caught him in the lip. I think they either gave him a bloody nose or a bloody lip. <laughs> I remember Christian saying, I just stopped thinking, oh no, I just lost my spot on another team. And he said he looked up and, and coach was just smiling at him and said, keep going, why are you stopping? So um, he just sort of took off from there, but you're exactly right, TJ, about about Christian. He's he's the guy when you talk about the Austin Bruins that everybody knows, right? I mean, um, a guy who wasn't sure if he was going to ever have a place to play hockey again when uh, when Fargo let him go, um, came down here, flourished, and uh, I guess the rest is sort of history for him, isn't it? And really, the first guy from the Bruins that that went on to play in the NHL too. So that um, you know that speaks a lot to why he's still so closely connected to the team. And when we put this list together, there was really, there was a bunch of guys in the air and there was a lot of honorable mentions. Nobody was as solid of a lock on this team than Christian Fallen. I mean, you have to include him and his pro career alone. It just, as it was, we take a look, I'm looking here, NHL 244 games, the American Hockey League 56. So that's 300 professional games on the nose for Christian Fall, and he is the representative for the Austin Bruins at the NHL level until some of these other guys get their chance to make their way up. Uh, Let's go ahead and make our way back down the list. Marcus Karlstrom. So this is a guy in the conversation uh, that I had heard of a little bit, but Mike Cooper was talking to me a little bit about, about Marcus Karlstrom and just how fluid of a skater he was and how strong he was on his feet. Cause he wasn't a small guy. He wasn't a big guy, six foot two, 190 pounds, but he had that European style of play. Do you remember much from Marcus Karlstrom? That's, that's what jumped out at, at me about Marcus. The, the number of times I got to see him play, um, you know, he played on a team here that didn't have, you know, a ton of success, but at the same time, same time had, had a lot of really good solid players come off of that but yeah he was another one of those guys that like you said just a, a fluid skater 
just looked effortless going up and down the ice. Um, it was a draft pick of the Winnipeg Jets, which, uh, you know, at that time, you didn't see a lot of guys in the NAHL, at least in terms of skaters, forwards, or defensemen who had been drafted in the NHL. Um, but, yeah, he, he was uh, – you know, he didn't score a lot of goals here. I think he only had one, actually, if I remember right. That's right, um, yeah. But he was always around the puck. Um, again, another one of those guys that could count on on the power play, penalty kill. Just a, a really smooth player and uh, a guy that I wish we could have seen here for more than a year. Yeah, and honestly, that's his only year in North America, too. That's the only year he's ever played any kind of hockey outside of his uh, native Sweden. But when you do look at his stats, yeah, he only had that one goal, but he had 23 assists for a total of 24 points in 51 games, which that just tells me as a defenseman, I guarantee if you ask any coach, hey, I got a defenseman who, like you said, is always around the puck and knows how to move the puck, knows how to get it out of the defensive end, start breakouts, you know, would you want this guy? That seems like that was Marcus Karlstrom, and he did a pretty darn good job for the Bruins in 15-16. Right, and was always capable of getting the puck to the net too, through traffic, which you know you want in a defenseman too. And he's another guy playing pro. He's playing in the Allsvenska League, which is the top professional league in Sweden, playing for Omtuna IS. So as we move down, we'll talk about the Denver pioneer, Lane Krenzen, which – Maybe it's recency bias. Maybe it's because I know him. Maybe it's because I've called games for him. But if you told me that I needed to pick someone who wore the Austin Bruins uniform and best exemplified what this team stands for, what this team strives to be, I would say the Austin Bruin, Mr. Austin Bruin is Lane Krenzen. I mean, this guy, he would lay down and block shots every single chance he could get. He was a leader, uh, you know, much like Travis Kothenbutel was in the sense that he didn't like to lose and he made everyone hear it when the team lost. Same thing with like a back knack. You know, he was the type who would take the team on his shoulders. If the team didn't play well, he didn't play well. If the team played well, he probably still didn't play well in his own mind, but everybody else did a great job. Lane Krenzen, one of the just absolute all-time good guys to come through this program and a leader, top five in games played for the Bruins. He's actually third um, all-time leading games played amongst defensemen as well. What do you remember from some of the games that you've seen from Lane? Well, just the things that you mentioned right there, TJ. I mean, if you ask me to give you just a, a instant reaction to, to the name Lane Krenzen, it would be shot blocker. Now, obviously, he had more skill and did a lot more things for the team than that. But just the guy that would sell out to do whatever he had to do. He would put the team in front of himself at all times. There's a reason he was a two-year captain, which we don't see a lot at this level. Um, and, and the fact that he you know, got an offer to go play at the University of Denver in, in a program of that magnitude is, is really cool because he's a guy that you know, he didn't play a lot for Denver this year. I can just see him being one of those guys that as his college career goes on, um, he's going to be another one of those leaders, whether he has a C on his jersey or not. He's going to be a guy that when he gets to be a junior and senior, his teammates look to um, at crunch time, and, and he's going to be a guy that they want around him and on the ice in key situations. I think if uh, if you if I were a betting man, I would absolutely say that he'd be wearing some kind of letter on his uniform by the end of his season, uh, senior season with Denver in three more years, because it's just, it's in his makeup. It's in his just chemical design. He was a captain at Duluth Marshall up in Duluth. He was obviously, as you mentioned, a two year captain here with the Bruins. It's just who he is as a person. And you're right. He didn't play a lot this year as a freshman, but again, a lot of times you don't, you know, especially for a program like Denver, which um, is constantly top 10 rated in the country. So there's a lot of good players ahead of you and you got to kind of wait your time out until you get on the ice. But Lane Krenzen playing here for three years. And I know it's a dying stat, but the plus minus is in my opinion, how you gauge a defenseman. You, you got to want to always be plus or somewhere close to neutral because that just means that you're helping your team more than you're hurting your team on the ice. Lane Krenzen would finish his career with the Bruins as a plus 22 for a guy that logged a lot of minutes. Lane Krenzen is another defenseman here on our all decade team. So we're going to keep going through with another recent guy and another really good kid who we're going to be watching pretty closely this year at Niagara, 
Joseph Meshach. Boy, talk about when you, you were talking about, um, I believe it was Nico Sturm and we were just, you're saying how you look at him and you just go, well, but he's got the NHL build. He's got the pro body build. So does Joe Meshack, man. I would not want to get hit by him. <laughs> right. And talk about a, a, just another guy that plays his role and, and does, you know, everything the team needs him to do. I feel like he's going to be one of those college guys that in, in you know, he's going to be a freshman this fall, but in say three years, one of those guys that that you're going to hear is sort of a, a sleeper, uh, you know, college free agent type guy that that pro scouts are looking at. Um, he just he has the tools. Um, you hit it on the head the the frame, the body. You know, what six three, two hundred pounds? Yeah, he can produce offense. He's a, he's a fantastic two way defenseman. A guy who you don't have to worry about him taking a night off. Nope. No, you know, and he's a guy that'll bounce back too. you know, I remember one game earlier this year, uh, he, it was a Friday, Saturday series at home. I can't remember who we were playing, but Friday night, he had an awful night. I mean, he just, it, it seemed like he was whiffing on every pass. He was whiffing on every single hit. He was getting pulled out of position. And the next night, he completely 180 and got back on track. And later that week I had him on the Austin Bruins show as my guest. And I flat out asked him, I was like, what's going on with you on Friday night? What happened? And he was the first to say, yeah, I played like absolute garbage, but you know, I, I wasn't zoned in. I took the 24 hours, got back out there Saturday because me Shaq in the two years that I called games and I watched him, if he had one bad night, he was not having a second bad night in a row. It just absolutely wasn't going to happen. He bounced right back and he didn't have that many bad nights to begin with. So we'll be uh, very curious to see his career at Niagara university because I, I want to see if he keeps up that offensive side of things because the first year that I got here, uh, his second year with the Bruins, 57 games played. He only had 13 points and he was still playing top line minutes. He was one of Steve Howard's guys for the last two, three years as one of his top D men. But this year he just completely exploded. He had more goals this season. They have points all of last year. He, it's like he learned a new unlocked a new skill in his arsenal. So I want to see, is he going to be the defensive defenseman? Is he going to be a two way player? How's Niagara going to use him? That's what I'm kind of curious to see coming up this, uh, this fall. Uh, last defenseman. We'll take a look. This is a guy that I did not see. So Jason, I'm going to go ahead and turn this one over to you. Ian Scheid. What do you remember about Ian Scheid, the Mankato commit? Uh, Ian, um, so he has a lot of connections to this area. His dad grew up in Rochester, um, played hockey at John Marshall. I believe he missed – John Marshall won a state championship in 1977. I think Ian's dad, Jim, graduated a year before that. So he was on a lot of great teams here, a multi-sport athlete, um, played college hockey at Wisconsin. Um, Ian's older brother, Eric, went and played hockey at Penn State, had a really good career out there. But Ian was um, – he was a quiet guy. But, boy, when he got on the ice uh, – you just you, another guy that you never had to worry about. You knew he was going to be in the right position. You knew he was going to make the right play. Um, he, he could get the puck out of his zone quickly, exactly what you want out of a defenseman in your own end. Um, could skate it out, pass it out, whatever you needed him to do. And he's gone on and shown the exact same thing at Minnesota State over the last four years. He's played in almost 160 games there, has close to 100 career points. Uh, just a, a phenomenal defenseman. Another guy that I want to watch and see if or where he's going to get an opportunity to play professional hockey, because if he does, he's going to excel at it. And uh, somebody's going to be really happy with, uh, with him on their blue line. It's curious to see when you take a look at his college stats, you know, usually with college players, you're going to see a very big increase in that second year in points. And then they kind of plateau. They stay around that same level for their junior and senior year. Um, you don't often see a guy come in, score 24 points in his rookie season, and then stay at that consistency throughout the rest. He goes 24, 26, 25, 22 points in each of his four seasons at Minnesota State Mankato. And it just, it's incredible to see. It, it tells you how natural of a player he is. And you're absolutely right. He's another one of the guys that I kind of have my Google alerts set for just in case he signs anywhere. And I somehow miss it on Twitter or something. We're keeping an eye out for him playing in a big program like that and having the impact 
Um, Ian Scheid could be the very next Austin Bruin to be signing a pro contract. So one more time, the defensemen, Corey Dunn, Christian Fallen, Marcus Carlstrom, Lane Krenzen, Joe Meshack, and Ian Scheid. The honorable mentions, Josh Brettner, who is the all-time defensive points getter for the Austin Bruins, Jed Pietela and Jaden Shields, both of them in top five games played for the Bruins and points as well, as far as defensemen are concerned, and Trevor Waldock. So, Let's go ahead and take a look at the goaltenders. Again, we're going in this list in alphabetical order. Alphabet begins with A, Keegan Asmundson, the current assistant coach and goaltending coach of the Austin Bruins. And I'll tell you right now, the reason he made this list, not only was he the first Bruin to ever suit up in the Bruins sweater, get a victory, he also still holds the record for the highest save percentage in a season at .923, and he was on statistically the worst Bruins team in history. It was their first year. They were the brand-new franchise. You, you can't expect to have solid players all over the place when you're a brand-new franchise, but here's Keegan holding down the fort with a .923 save percentage, and, of course, he went on to a great career at Canisius, went on to a long pro career to the point where he was the first person that works for the Austin Bruins. I've known him longer than anyone else. He was a goaltender in the SPHL the same year that I was there. And as a matter of fact, he had the dubious honor of kicking my team out of the first round of the playoffs and going on to win a president's cup that year. So I thought that was pretty intriguing, but Keegan Asmundson's our number one. Can you think all the way back to that first year? Do you remember him as a goalie? That's a long time ago. There's been a lot of players come through between then and now. But, um, I mean, when you're starting a, a brand new team, especially at a high level like the NHL, that's where you want to start, right, is, is building from the net out. And, um, you know, they couldn't have picked a better guy than Keegan. And that was a – the Bruins had a pretty good team for being brand new that year. They had a lot of guys that went on to play uh, college hockey. And, and as – you see with a lot of first-year teams in the league, they had a lot of different players kind of shuffle through the, the team and the lineup. But Keegan was that constant for them, a guy that they always knew, you know, no matter how the team was playing that night, he was going to be back there for them. His numbers showed it that year. And uh, obviously college and, and professional coaches and scouts sat in him too. And not to be overlooked, one of the other reasons that we put him on our all-decade team is the fact that he is the assistant coach and current goaltending coach because not only did he have an impact on the ice back then, but he's now affecting the Austin Bruins this year um, and next year as a coach. He's you know grooming that next batch. And I think when you take a look at Brett Miller's numbers, who had the opportunity this season to become the number one goalie after last year, playing second fiddle to Kyle McClellan, Miller exploded onto the scene this season, was having easily his best career or season in his junior career. And I think in, in some aspects, in a lot of aspects, that's because of Keegan. So let's take a look at our second goaltender, Jake Kiley, another guy with professional hockey experience after he signed last year with the Vancouver Canucks system. Do you remember much from Jake Kiley? I would think so. He's a little bit more recent. Absolutely. Jake played um, again, another guy from that 14, 15 team that, that hosted the Robertson cup there at Riverside arena. Um, but yeah, he was a guy that he, he put up really good numbers, but he split time uh, pretty much that entire season with Evan Smith, who was a seventh round draft pick of Nashville that following summer, um, then went on to play in the uh, Western Hockey League. Yeah, was, I was going to say the W, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Didn't go so, anywhere from there. Did not, which is sort of surprising for a big goalie who moved well, but Jake's the same way. Uh, another big goalie who who could really move well in the net. Um, another one of those guys that, yeah, he had a really strong team in front of him, but part of it was they knew that they had a guy back there who had their back if, if there was any messing up. Um, and he, uh, he backstopped them through a great regular season um, and, and played really well in the postseason too. I think he played in that, that last game in the Robertson Cup um, on a night where – so the first game of the Robertson Cup finals that year, the best two or three – was at the time maybe still is the longest game in NHL history. It went four overtimes. Yep. Everyone's lost on a heartbreaking goal, obviously, at that point. And then, obviously, the energy level wasn't quite there the next night. Jake did everything he could. But, uh, you know, a heck of a goalie went on, to, had a great college career. You know, we talked about Nico Sturm earlier. It's funny how their paths, you know, mirrored each other. They were with one another from their time in Austin 
all the way through the end of last season in Clarkson. Now they're both off playing pro hockey, signed NHL contracts. Um, so it's great to see Jake moving on. And, and uh, he played a lot in the ECHL this year. Um, hopefully he can work his way up and, and uh, you know, keep climbing in the Canucks organization. Yeah, and it's funny um, when you talk about his three years at Clarkson, he actually was an assistant captain in his junior and what ended up being his final year last year, which is not a common thing at the college level, at the junior level, at any level, uh, to see goaltenders wearing A's on their sweater. Now, it's for a goalie, it's mostly ceremonial. They don't have the responsibility of meeting the referees, you know, outside the scorer's table to get official rulings or anything. But that just tells you how much of a leader he was in the locker room alongside Nico Sturm, as you mentioned. And uh, as far as his pro career he's played in two games in the American Hockey League where he has a very very small goals against average 1.84 goals against in two games in Utica for the Comets but he's played most of his pro career with the Kalamazoo Wings with Jay Dickman so more Bruins connections all over the place that was Jake Kiley and we'll take one final goaltender on our all-decade team how could you leave him off the list? You absolutely can't. He holds the record for almost every goaltender stat the Bruins have. He played here for three solid years, went on to a D1 commitment at Minnesota, Nick Lair. Tell me about Nick Lair as a player from that era. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about Christian Fall and kind of being the guy still that people think of when they think of the Bruins. We talk about how Lane Krenzen kind of fits in that same mold you're going to look for a goalie to put in that category, it has to be Nick. I mean, like you just said, his, his name is at the top of just about every statistical category. He won more than 80 games. I mean, who does that in junior hockey career? Played in, what did we say, 120-some games maybe that he played in? Appearances? I can't, I can't remember what the number is, but it was up over 100 games. Um, just, you know, this first Bruin to go on and play for the Gophers. He's a – Twin Cities native, um, just a – and a good guy, too. He was another one of those guys where you know, he just knew – if he was on and you could you could see when he was really on, um, you could just see it in the rest of the team. It, it radiated out from the goal. Um, and you knew early if Nick was on his game, if he was really on. And, and again, like I said, the, the, his teammates just fed off of that, and, and you love to see that as a, as a goal, you know, and that you got guys in front of you that are, are going to go play for you. So our three goalies for the All-Decade team, Keegan Asmundson, Jake Kiley, and Nick Lair. Some of our honorable mentions, the seventh-round draft pick of the Carolina Hurricanes, currently at Providence College, Jacob Kucharski, Kyle McClellan, Mad Sogard, the highest-drafted Bruin in the history of the team, second round, 39th overall. Uh, he was the second goalie off the board last draft, and Mad's tandem partner, Alex Schilling. And one of the reasons we didn't put Mads on the list was simply because he wasn't the number one when he was here. Alex Schilling really shouldered most of the weight during that 17-18 season. As talented as Mads is, I don't want to say was, he is. He's now playing up in Medicine Hat. But Alex Schilling kind of took things over. But Keegan, Kylie, and Lair ended up being our three for the All-Decade team. So, Jason, I want to get here from you. What guys would you have put in and what guys would you have put out? You know, it's funny, TJ, when you, when you sent me the list originally or when I looked at it, I'm like, wow, you know, this is a fantastic list. They couldn't have left anybody off here, right? And then you go back and you look through the stats year by year and you're like, wow, look, at, just look at all these guys that you could argue for being on this team. Um, you know, I don't think any of the choices that we've talked, any of the players were, were bad choices. Um but there have been so many good players to come through here. You know, you look at a guy like uh, Eamon McAdam, another goalie. He didn't play many games here, but was a, an NHL draft pick. Evan Smith, who we talked about a little bit ago, um, split time with Jake Kiley in 14-15. He was an NHL draft pick. Um, you know, Brett Miller, going to RPI. He's been uh, very successful for the Bruins. Um, you know, some other guys just off the top of my head, I think back to the the earliest Bruins teams and a defenseman, Nolan Curley, who only had about 25 career points, but I, I would think he would have to be right up there in terms of uh, penalty minute record holders. If oh, he is <laughs> sitting right at the top. <laughs> I think he was well over 400 if I remember right, but you know, it's just guys like that who aren't necessarily all over the score sheet, but you have to have those guys to play all those roles if you want a successful team. And uh, there have been so many of them. To 
come through here that we could probably name two or three teams and still leave guys off who are deserving. As matter, I had to look. Nolan Curley, 410 penalty minutes. The closest <laughs> player to him is Connor Millimock with 281. So we unless Connor this- Millimock has 140 <laughs> penalty minutes this coming season with the Bruins, I think Curley's record is safe. Yeah, I, I think maybe they probably should have named the uh, the penalty box in Riverside after Nolan <laughs> at some point. They, they, they probably should have. Put a um, plaque or something in their farm. Just, yeah, something, some kind of wall hanging, right? <laughs> I'm sure they could make it happen. Put it on the inside boards just so everybody knows you're in Curly's seat. <laughs> oh, Jason, well, thanks so much for coming on talking Austin Bruins, the all-decade team with me. How can everybody out there listening get a hold of you, get a hold of the Post Bulletin? Yeah, thanks, TJ. This was a, a blast. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, at PBFeldy, F-E-L-D-Y, postbulletin.com backslash sports. Um, you know, those are, are great ways to find uh, not only our hockey coverage, but everything else we do. And hopefully we can uh, get over to Austin a little bit more this winter. Having the Grizzlies here, too, is, is taking a chunk of our uh, hockey coverage. But it's great to have them in town and nice to see the Bruins coaches over here, um, usually once a week or so, working with the team. And like I said, hopefully we can, can get back over to Austin and, and do some more Bruins coverage in the fall. Once and we're able no- to get back on the ice. Nobody does it like you guys. Nobody does it like you guys. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm, I'm clicking your links. And if you're out there listening and you see the Bruins, you'll see us tweet Jason's articles all the time about the Bruins, about the Grizzlies. Nobody covers southeastern Minnesota hockey, sports, you name it. And, and if, you, if you have any questions about the high school landscape, particularly hockey, these guys are the guys. Hey, just want to remind everybody before we go real quick, Bruins face masks are still available. So if you'd like to get one of those face masks, masks as part of our buy one give one program send me an email tj at austinbruins.com the bruins are in the uh nahl virtual robertson cup they're on to round two game one was tonight against the aberdeen wings the bruins lost that one three two in regulation so they're down in the series one to nothing and the most important part everybody here wants to watch the real austin bruins Season tickets are on sale right now. Give me a call at the office, 507-434-4978. We'll get you all set up for next season. We're planning on starting on time until somebody tells us any different. Jason, thanks again. I really appreciate your time. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me, TJ. Appreciate it. That'll do it for this edition of the Austin Bruins Show. Stay tuned. we got plenty more coming up this offseason. We'll talk to you all again. My name is TJ Shalott. Have a great night, everybody.